Good evening and welcome to our members and guests. My name is Emma Davidson and I'm the president of the Oxford and Cambridge Society in Malaysia. Thank you for joining us this evening. Malaysians and political observers have been buffeted and battered by the latest round of political maneuvering and constitutional tribulations. We are all keen to hear from someone who is at the eye of that storm. At this stage of the pandemic and given the economic and educational state of the nation, the outcome of this crisis could not be more important. So we are delighted that YB Datuk Sri Hang Lima Mohamed Shafi bin Abdal is joining us today. Please do put your questions in the live chat and we'll send them through to the studio. So first, let me introduce your moderators for this evening. Faisal Arif is the secretary of the Oxford and Cambridge Society in Malaysia, he now runs a tech startup after a career in investment management in the UK, Singapore and Malaysia. He studied law at Peterhouse, Cambridge, Columbia University, New York, uh, where he was a Fulbright scholar. Daniel Rahman, um, another one of our EXCO members, is a director at the Sunway Education Group. He holds an undergraduate law degree from the International Islamic University Malaysia and also a master's in law from the University of Oxford. Our guest, YB Datuk Sri Panglima Mohamed Shafi bin Abdal, is the former Chief Minister of Sabah, current Member of Parliament for Semporna, and a member of the Sabah State Legisl Legislative Assembly, and is the first and founding president of Warisan. So welcome, Datuk Sri Shafi Abdal. Thank you so much for joining us and for finding time for us this evening in your busy schedule. We're very honored. I'm going to hand you over now to Daniel. Assalamu alaikum, Datuk Sri, and good evening. How are you today? Warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Emma and Daniel. Well, I'm fine. Uh, recovering. <laughs> That's good. I can believe you've been quite busy these past few days. Uh, so today's topic we have is where does Malaysia go from here? And already just looking at the YouTube, we've got so many questions and so many people watching. So allow me, Datuk Sri, to kick this off by asking, um, over the last few days, we've seen uh, a lot of developments in the political space, uh, whether it's in terms of the numbers, um, we, your support, um, you know, who is the candidate on the Pakatan Harapan and the PM candidate and the DPM candidate. And in that sense, it's truly been an unprecedented time. Um, if you could share with us your opening thoughts on what are the, what are, what on, you know, this fast changing political situation, and can you enlighten us on what's currently happening? Well, Daniel and Emma, and uh, I must express, I've been indeed delighted to be invited uh, this evening by you all. And uh, that was a, quite a big question to answer. I mean, uh, you know that well. Uh, it's not, not something unfamiliar in any kind of political environment. In Malaysia, we have even constitutional crisis then, way back in 1980s or 70s, like that, in, in, in our country. Similarly, in Sabah, too, there was a lot of transition of government from one another to the other. But unfortunately, as uh, you have put it rightly, I mean, it's unprecedented kind of environment when we are facing, coupled with only with uh, economic instability, but also coronavirus as well, and the political kind of evil in our country, which is indeed affecting us so badly. And uh, this is rooted from the very fact that uh, when, after the general elections of 14, PR 14, right from the very beginning when the Pakatan Harapan plus Warisan and the rest mandated by the government with a simple majority of 125 seats in the one if I'm not mistaken and as a result of somehow it was hijacked the mandate of the riot was hijacked by the through the Sheraton move Daniel if you remember that and yep. that's yep. how it started and it was led by my friend uh, Tan Sri Mayudin and the rest and somehow the people's mandate was uh, shifted uh, to the other side and uh, he worked together with Amno. And uh, Amno, mm -hmm. the last and last, you know, the people for the first time in the history of Malaysia after uh, getting the country independent, in, I think it was more than 60 years, they yeah. lost the election. And then mm -hmm. the people changed. And somehow uh, that sort of support given by the people never, never have we seen that. In, uh, in Malaysia, uh, a political party like UMNO, 
uh, supported by their partners component like MCA and MIC lost the elections. And right. indeed, that was how it happened. So now we are facing a problem too. There's some even constitutional problem. But actually, as I mentioned just now, it's rooted from the sort of like Sheraton move, the hijack of the people's mandate. And yeah. now what is happening, it isn't very sad to see. It's merely sort of like changing a curtain in a room. You know, okay. mm -hmm. in a room, uh, sort of like where, you know, leadership within that sort of AMNO and as well as Bersatu, Bersatu and AMNO and now is led by Bersatu sort of like group. And it is indeed very sad to see this. Where it will uh, definitely is very unstable. I just wonder how they can see eye to eye. I mean, Bersatu and AMNO in the future. So this is indeed this. Uh, as I said just now, it's a mere change of uh, curtain in the room. Yeah. So, and, and if I may, uh, Dr. Sri, you know, it's been 17 months, um, and now there's an interim prime minister, and this process sort of is happening all over again. A bit of post Sheraton deja vu, if you may call it that. Um, and, and of course, we all know that as of 4 p.m. today, all the members of parliament had to submit statutory declarations on who they unequivocally, uh, clearly and without condition support as the next prime minister of this country. Um, do you have any thoughts on this or have you heard uh, from the uh, palace um, any updates on what has happened since? Well, I have yet to hear anything from them. Actually, uh, it has been kept secret. Even when we met the king and uh, Sultan Azam Shah, the deputy of uh, king as well was there present together with others as well the speaker of the house the upper house and the lower house uh, were also present together with the ag and the uh, who else were there and we were reminded to ensure that we have to use for example the instrument of sd to determine uh -huh. who is going to be the next prime minister mm -hmm. out of that and uh, sort of like it, it has to be somehow validated through after this Whoever is going to be uh, getting the position of the prime minister is, is is not only through the process of getting SD, but also the need for, for it to be validated in parliament and immediately. Yeah. I, I believe the prime minister, by convention, normally, uh, yeah. once he's appointed and so on, and he has to set up his own cabinet. And having done that, that's a convention. And then he, he, it has to go to parliament to ensure that he is the sort of like the legal or the valid kind of uh, prime minister to the process of getting SD because under the constitution I think it's quite really spelled out there yeah. where uh, 43 4 the moment the prime minister lose the confidence of the people of the members of uh, parliament then he ceases to become either he seek for uh, sort of like uh, dissolutions of parliament but unfortunately, because of the environment that we are facing, uh, we did indicate it is indeed not viable. It's not the environment is really not suitable for, for, for us to have another elections because it can cost human life. So right. uh, well, almost all of us decided for that. So somehow uh, then uh, we decided it is better for us to sort of like use the instrument of law and the constitutions where to empower the king under Article 43, bracket 2, where the, prior, the, the king had the power right. to uh, to appoint or even his opinion, uh, command uh, the confidence of the, the MPs. But that has to be validated in right. the parliament. So speaking, so, right. I haven't heard anything. I mean, uh, <laughs> it is with the palace. Right? So what, right. what is important? Uh, I, I must say that, Daniel, I mean, uh, it was indeed very sad that when the confidence and mandate of the people was taken by those group uh, through the Sheraton war. It was very unfortunate that the government right. was not handling, uh, uh, managing the country well. Where you have said, we have, you have seen that, for example, that how they operate, they were not properly coordinated. I mean, you have, you have heard and seen ministers were making announcements. They were operating sort of like in silence. Uh, particular minister said uh, they need for us to lock down and one particular ministry said well unlock that because because we need to sort of like you know re uh, invoke that sort of uh, feeling among businesses to ensure yeah. that uh, you know economy is vibrant yeah that's true if i may if i may if just quickly interject so considering that the government as you have mentioned or the the former government 
um, after the Sheraton move did not manage the situ COVID situation properly. Um, and then, you know, just before the, the interim prime minister resigned previously, there was sort of an offer to work together um, in order to bring about reforms, right? Um, but that was very quickly shot down by um, Pakatan Harapan, uh, even Warisan issued a statement against it. Um, why not have explored that? Because this would have been that exploration week. And why, you know, has it led instead to the situation that we have now? Well, if you look into it, the, the, the main issue here is because the current government, the current outfit that we have now and the PN have lost the trust coming from the people, not only coming from the representative of parliament, you know, 220 now, but you have realized that the trust is no longer there. Why the trust is not there? Because there's no transparency. I mean, you have seen, for example, the amount of money that we have spent to the magnitude of more than 500 billion, never in the history, within a short period of time in our country. Normally, the budget is mounting to about 200 billion uh, particular in a particular year. But uh, unfortunately, hardly less than two years, you know, money has been spent more than almost 600 or 500 billion. And there was no clarity in it. I mean, uh, and also the outcome. We haven't seen the outcome from the amount of money that has been spent. And also the amount of people has been, I mean, unemployment more than to the magnitude of 1 million, people dying more than how many thousands already, more than almost 12,000, commit suicide, 1,000 plus, unemployment and businesses closed. And here you are, the government, after packages, they have already forwarded to us, explained, I mean, uh, offering to us, but, but another package is coming up with all the sort of like recovery plan and uh, there's no trust in the previous government. So that's why the reason why we didn't buy that sort of thing, uh, of a uh, proposal coming from uh, the PN government then, because we were quite confident that they're incapable. Okay. Not because, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I said uh, they have proven that they had failed to run the country as were the people and we expected of them. So I think this is one of the fundamental issues. It's not just merely that well, we offer you, you know, for example, like getting the 18 years old to be a voters in the incoming uh, elections. Actually, we have already endorsed that. We have already approved that. It was approved in the previous, uh, I think if I'm mistaken, last year with two third majority. And it was delayed somehow by the current government. They said, no, it's not the time for us to enable this 18 years old because we they are not mature enough to decide what's the future of the country. Well, why did parliament pass in the first place? And they were they were part and parcel of the people who, who decided to pass that bill. And on top of that, they introduced that sort of law, like, you know, a new law, you know, those kind of, there shouldn't be any frog coming in, jumping from one another to another party. I mean, you can imagine who is doing that for the, in the first place. I was managing the state of Sabah with two third majority. It was a stable government at that time, and we were able to manage the uh, COVID in, in Sabah, but it was hijacked to the use of high-handed system under the government and also bribing them with what uh, also things. And uh, it, it, you know, it caused all, all sort of problems politically in the country. You know, right. that's hey. why I mean, it, it is not just by enticing us, by having that sort of packages and also this is a new plan. You have failed to do that. After one right. and a half years, I kept quiet. You know, I didn't make noise in parliament, neither did I criticize openly. So I just said, well, give them a chance to, to govern the country. But realizing the number of people dying, the number of unemployment, the economy, I mean, the amount of money that we have spent, should we just keep quiet? Or should we just uh, pro uh, support the government of the day? I mean, you have seen changes, for example, like in Japan. I mentioned this, uh, changes in United Kingdom. You know, in Japan, about five prime ministers in a year. Well, they still produce Toyota. They were able to, use to produce like car like Lexus. People still go to hospital and police still function. It doesn't mean that if there's some kind of uh, the need for us to change leadership or government of the country, it will cause a people in, in particular. I mean, I mean, you just look at what happened in Canada. Remember, it's a change of government. Right. So, if, I, if I may jump in, um, I'll pass it on to Faisal now. Go ahead, Faisal. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Shri, I've just got a question on the emergency expenditures. You mentioned billions have gone out the door. If you go back into power in the next few days, will you compel a full audit of all emergency expenditures uh, under the emergency government? Well, it is indeed very important and very crucial for us to ensure that there must be accountability. This is a public fund. Mm -hmm. Every cent counts. I mean, yeah. you can imagine people work so hard. The fishermen, farmers, retailers in the country, and you tax them. Mm -hmm. And because we generate income coming from taxes, mm -hmm. not only from other resources, for example, like the sales of oil, you know, plantations, but uh, should we say that, okay, after change of government, this must not be looked into? I think Definitely the country is money. We should be looking at it. I mean, there must. that's why we have an outfit, for example, like Public Account Committee that that's has right. been set up in the country to ensure that we need to scrutinize yeah. where the money goes to, whether it was intended, for example, like when you talk about the Mice Jatra, you know, spend about 70 million. Hardly mm -hmm. used in places like in Sabah where there's no connectivity, mm -hmm. where certain poor people doesn't have handphone. Even uh, if they have hand, I mean, if they have handphone, they can't even connect themselves. So this is yeah. the thing that we need to question. Where I think mm -hmm. is indeed not just because we want to be punitive in our nature of governing the country, but I think accountability. Mm -hmm. It is indeed yeah. good governance that is very crucial. That's why yeah. if you don't don't uh, sort of like uh, realize that, that's why yeah. you lose confidence. From the people, not only yeah. from people like members of parliament, but public at large. I mean, for yeah. example, like for those people eating durian, you know, they got penalized. For those people who are in power, in positions, they're not yeah. compounded. I mean, that yeah. sort of double standard of practice in our country. Yeah. That can, you can imagine, the trust is it's not there. So I yeah. think it is indeed fundamental, I mean, Faisal, to yeah. ensure looking into the, the detail part of it. Of course, they use the instrument of emergency yes. to ensure that they are protected. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, this is, I think, that's why we did question in parliament whether there's a need for us to have emergency in this country. Yeah. I mean, it is not used uh, as a tool to overcome the problem of COVID because it was clearly yeah. spelled out by Kansi Mayudin that emergency is purposely intended yeah. for overcome the problem of COVID. Yeah. But you can imagine the money was spent not only for COVID. I mean, out of that 500 billion, yeah. we only spent less than 10 billion on COVID. Yeah. On, I mean, uh, where the money goes, I mean, the rest of the money. And we need mm. to question that too. Great. Um, Dr. Sri, you mentioned just now that Sabah was hijacked, right? Um, <laughs> and that resulted all kinds of turmoil uh, last year. Now, uh, th I've got a question on sort of like the decision making process there. Because when Tan Sri Muhyiddin lost his majority, he had a choice between resigning as PM and allowing a new PM to take over or dissolving parliament and calling for elections. Uh, that's his right as PM to recommend whichever course of action to the Agong, right? Now, you had a similar choice to make last year, 30th of July, 2020. Either resign as chief minister and let whomever has a majority become the CM or dissolve the state assembly and call for elections. Um, and you decided to call for elections. Now, you've gone on record in parliament and Hansard that you'd rather die in the political arena, yeah, Gelanggang politic, than resign and hand over power to kleptocrats and cash as king crowd and things like that. But your detractors have pointed to that decision, to the spread of COVID uh, afterwards. A lot of people have, you know, as you mentioned before, there's a trust deficit. Uh, between politicians and the rakyat. So, you know, it, it, first question is, in retrospect, in the interest of the country, should you have just resigned instead of calling for elections? And the follow-on to that is, you know, has politics in Malaysia become so toxic and personality-driven that, you know, we'd rather, um, what they call, uh, dissolve parliaments rather than hand over power to our biggest enemies and rivals? Well, Faisal, it's a one, tough one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's a tough one. So, Sorry, but you know, it's it's on people's I, minds. I, no, it's not a tough one. I mean, uh, it was not resulted a COVID spike in Sabah yeah. from the election. That I, I, uh, you know, as people claim, 
it started with the hijackers, you know. I mean, as you put it rightly, I mean, I could have said that, okay, hand over. Yeah. But this is where I think the law in this country must prevail. At that time, at that particular moment, when, when COVID was so low, I mean, there was no death casualty in the cases in Sabah during that moment. You know, even yeah. the rate was so small and we were better able to manage it. I mean, for example, like when there was a spike in Wuhan, we were the only state in the country to ban yeah. passengers coming, plane coming from, you know, uh, that particular part of the world. But I didn't refrain, for example, like aircraft coming from Beijing, Shanghai, you know, even from KL for that matter, because, you know, it mm. is indeed for us. We need to manage. We are not, we, we are not chasing uh, people here. We are chasing the disease, COVID. Yeah. So at that particular moment, it was rather very small. So I look at it. When I, I realized that, I said, no, no, the environment was not so difficult to, for us to uh, having the elections. I discussed that really with some of my colleagues. But we don't, we cannot allow, for example, like the mandate of the people to be handed over. I mean, you just imagine now, Faisal, for example, like in this country, how sure are you that after this sort of like process, giving SD to the people, you will be able to see Amno and Bersatu can see eye to eye running the country. Yeah. I mean, the values of all mm -hmm. these MPs who are driven by green. I mean, I'm so sorry to say that for power and position and money. I mean, do we allow that to happen in the country? I mean, we have to have responsibility. Yeah. So be it, for example, like when we had elections, you know, I had the biggest majority. I could have been appointed as a chief minister. But yeah. those people, Amno and those, they were fighting among themselves and they collaborate together. There was too high handed the system. Some of them, you know, using uh, SPRM, income tax, police, were they intimidating some of the YBs and they form the number. I know that. I saw I, uh, it was happening. So I didn't even, some lawyers said that you can drag them to court and because you have the number 30 plus, the biggest of all in, in Sabah then. So I, I told him, I said, no, no, no. He said, the people's decision is now. You know, I rather don't, don't want to drag that to court. I think let's have some stability. That's why I didn't pursue that. But it started, for example, like uh, those guys coming in, they were there. I told him, I said, leave it to Sabah. You know, yeah. how we manage it. But in spite of that, I think it's not because of the election that we had the spike was there. We were able to reduce the number, actually. You know, we yeah. were able to uh, lock down, for example, the island of uh, Gaia. You know, we use uh, MCO then. We were better able to manage COVID. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine now, it's not because of just election spike in, uh, there will be spike in, I mean, this been happening in other part of the country. I mean, yeah. Sarawak and, uh, you know, Kedah is even higher now. Almost mm. 1,000 plus. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Gaia Island uh, a minute ago. And mm. um, you know, I consulted some uh, friends of mine in Sabah. One of the biggest issues in Sabah, as I understand it, is illegal immigration. right? Mm -hmm. And it is a long-standing problem. Uh, it's been there for a very, very long time. Um, and it's spread you know, to Semenanjung as well. There's you know, accounts uh, in books on... Um, illegals in Sabah getting ICs and working in um, Semenanjung, for example, right? Now, there, there's like different views on this. There's a hardline view saying that they are illegal. They should all be deported without compromise. There is a pragmatic view. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the Daily Express last year uh, with the temporary uh, pass, Sabah temporary pass, it's better for us to coordinate and monitor them and uh, better than knowing nothing about them uh, and where they are, right? And then there's a you know soft left-wing libertarian view. Look, they've been in this country for a very long time. They've made major contributions to Sabah's economy over several decades. Let's make sure stateless children, for example, can go to school and get adequate health care. Um, you know, this <coughs> issue on the Sabah temporary pass, uh, after the Kimanis by-election, you decided not to pursue it anymore. If you were to come back into power, would you pursue that reform? Is it still on the cards? Well, uh, it's under the purview of the federal government, actually. It was mooted. It was proposed by then uh, Tan Sima Yunin. He was the minister. That right. sort of temporary yeah. pass uh, to enable those illegal people to be around because we were, yeah. we were better able, for example, to identify where they are. It is better to know where they are rather than just left them there. 
without yeah. us knowing. They're almost everywhere. Yeah. And unless we do also operations uh, through, uh, through, 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 through other outfit like police department to verify, to find out whether they are illegal or not. But it's a tedious yeah. job. So I thought that I think, uh, you know, somehow we have to work closely with the federal government because it is under responsibility of federal government uh, managing the you know, illegal people mm -hmm. in the whole country because I see and documents are produced not by the state government of Sabah, it is produced by federal government. So I think the need for us to collaborate closely with them to really to ensure not only if they are there for the purpose of providing services, for example, like labors, uh, yeah. The need for us to enable the plantation sector, to, uh, plantation sector to move forward, and then even the fishing industry needing their their services too, and then we will need the need for us to identify to produce that sort of document to them. Working pass, for example, like you know, I, I did propose to foreign minister, then I can't remember who was that then, to talk to uh, to our neighboring countries, Philippines, you know, to ensure yeah. that issue passport, you know. And uh, either, either from Philippines, Indonesia, to ensure that they are legally here. We have yeah. to recognize that they can earn a living here. And also mm -hmm. the issues, myself, mm -hmm. when you talk about the stateless kids, I mean, this is something that's really uh, the need for human like us, you know, yeah. the, to ensure that they need help, they need protections. I mean, uh, it is not because of their own doing. Some of these poor young stateless kids are there. Hardly, you know, without food sometimes. I saw them with my own eyes. And I yeah. told the department, uh, Unity Department, to manage it. Provide a place for them. House them. You know, if you can uh, live together with animals like cat, I mean, a human being too. Yeah. They, they don't have race. They don't have religion. Why can't we manage them? I mean, yeah. we have responsibility in our life as a human being. Yeah. As a country. But of course, in Kimanis, when there was a by-election, they use it as a tool. They said, oh, they're, you know, they're protecting the illegals, you know. That's right. Well, well we, we did some effort to, to ensure we work closely with the federal government. We sent more than about 10,000 when I was then the chief minister back to Philippines, back even yeah. to Indonesia. So I think, but staggered it where they have documents. And I, we did ask them, inform the police department, which one the federal, ensure those people, they can come back with a proper document if they need to find jobs here because we need the workforce as well. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, uh, to, to entice local people to work in the construction sector is quite difficult because it's yes. a hard job for them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I hope I answered your question. back over myself. to Dan. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. I, I'd love to sit down with you for hours and hours and chat about this, but I, I'll have to hand it over <laughs> yeah. back to Dan because he's got That's some very interesting methods. Uh, Thanks, Faisal. And some of the comments, I thought uh, um, the public, I totally agree with you on the statelessness issue and the need to show more compassion. Uh, I'd like to bring us back to a bit more of the federal politics and ongoing situation. So maybe just a very quick response from you, W3. How confident do you, uh, PH Plus, uh, Warisan, feel uh, after the 4 p.m. vote, just on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, uh, I was one of the contender initially. That's right. So, yeah. because, uh, I realized then... Uh, I mean, coming from that part of the world, Sabah and Sarawak, after having independent for more than 60 years now, none of us have been able to sort of like, uh, you know, contribute to building this country. And uh, after having served the country for more than 30 years in KL, from being political secretary, parliamentary secretary, deputy minister and minister too. So we thought that why not? It's the moment for us to offer ourselves, to render our services to at least a better understanding. We, when we provide a policy, for example, like in our country, it is not just top-down kind of approach. It must be bottom-up. I realized that, for example, like when I was in rural ministry, construction of road, when you construct a road, a kilometer of road in KL, it can cost you less than a thousand or a hundred thousand ringgit, for example, like. But in Kuching, in Sarawak, not in Kuching, in Sarawak, remote area, you know, in very remote area, even in Sabah, like in Long Pasia, there, my goodness, in Sarawak, when you need to transport bin, uh, bentumin, you know, all sort of component to build road, you have to go on board by the riverside, you know. And the cost is so huge. It can be, you know, five times the cost. So if you apply a policy, for example, like through Ministry of Finance in KL, there, or the cost for construction of road, the kilometer, all across the board, is 100,000. 
we, you cannot attract people, contractor, to build that particular road because surely they will be they will be bankrupted by it. they can't they can't earn money because they have to transport the raw material. So that's why one of the reasons why I said why don't you know we offer ourselves to ensure that unwind that sort of all policies in the country, the need for us to live it, you know, to ensure that touch them. You know, the, the people in that particular area in Sabah and Sarawak for the first time. I mean, you have been having Prime Minister coming from northern part of Kedah, where my wife's come from. Uh, two of them, Tunku, Tun Mahathir, then Penang, Pala was there, and uh, Pahang, almost three people, Johor, two, and why not from Sabah? Why not from Sabah? I mean, oh, on that point. And then, and then okay. why I, I did mention this, so I mean, it is indeed timely. You've done your whole work. <laughs> the, the, wind, the wind come from the east, I said, you know. Yeah. It's not that because I did my homework, because I think it's not me. I'm, I'm not talking about myself. I mean, sure. there can be others better than me. I said, why not, you know, coming from that part of the world uh, to ensure that, you know. When I had to chat with, for example, my friend Tun Musa Hitam, you know, Shafi, I love Sabah. You know why? Because you can sit together you know, respect of race and religion. I mean, I remember when I was studying in England, you know, I had my lunch, seated down in you, and one of the English boy was just seated by my side and he was eating that sort of things, you know, ham and bacon, whatever it is. I, I took my fish and chips. Had it been in, in like in KL, no, you sit down there, chase them away because that is haram, you know. And I know that was this country. Who can I chase away? I mean, in Islam, it's quite clearly mentioned there, stipulated in Quran, you know, you don't eat. That guy was eating it. You know, I didn't add that. But it is, it doesn't mean that it's haram for me to look. If it's haram for you to look, your eyes, you control your eyes. I mean, that sort of things. So that's why I said that to, 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 to Musa was, I, Malaysia should have been like that, where we can live happily together, you know, respective of race and religion. And that's indeed very important for us. I mean, we must be inclusive enough. I've seen through history, for example, like John F. Kennedy, you know, when he bid it for, you know, presidents of, uh, you know, America then in 1960 plus, I think. I was young then. I didn't realize that. He got shot. And I didn't know for whatever reason. But I looked to the process of how he got into the office. He was fighting for the black. You know, I, I even mentioned to Tun Mahathir when I had the opportunity to sit down with him. I said, Tun, can you imagine? Nobody have thought that Obama can be the prime minister of uh, president of the US, a black mm -hmm. guy. Even for that matter, Kamala now become the vice president of the US. I mean, mm -hmm. in United mm -hmm. Kingdom, you guys have been studying there. Have you imagined? I went in England, I went to London in 1976, if I'm mistaken. That was way back, long time ago. And uh, I couldn't imagine that, you know, an Indian guy, Pakistani guy, become the mayor of London then. You know, but now it's mm -hmm. happening. Not only Mayor of London is an Indian fi finance minister too. I mean, we have to move forward. Why can uh, Malaysians coming from that part of the area, you know, offer themselves to be that? So that's oh, why. That's I, really, why not? So you know, it doesn't mean that we are not able. We are not capable. I mean, uh, we want to offer ourselves to. That's why I said why not. And then after that, what happened was because uh, Anwar Ibrahim also offered himself. You know, and uh, we did decide, I said, start with 105, I said, you know, where the base is, because that is the uh, number of MPs coming from that particular group, the opposition block, sort of. You know, I said, we start with 105. You know, if you have a better number, then you have to concede. I have to concede. So if I have a better number, you have to concede. So that sort of thing. So I, I decided, I said, you know, it could have been uh, better for me if I'm, I was the one to entice the Sarawakian members of parliament. As a candidate. I was, yeah. was going to ask you the next question no. about enticing the Sarawakians. Um, could you maybe share with us some insight on what's going on there? Because there were some cryptic uh, messages coming out earlier today where there was no firm position being taken by GPSO. And, and you, you speak so passionately about Sabah and Rawa, and we all know that those of us in Sumananjong often say, if only we can be a little bit more like what we see in Sabah and Sarawak, the brotherhood, the unity, eating at, at, at shops together, you know, and, and that's, that's a very common thing among uh, Malaysians. So if you could just give us some insight onto that, uh, like you said, enticing the, the Sarawakian uh, MP counterparts. Well, before that, actually, I sat down with them in parliament. 
a uh, few of them they said uh, why not because i've been fighting for you know 63 because that was the dream of our forefather getting malaysia to be independent so i even uh, discussed that with mahadir said when i was then uh, the chief minister i said why not you know to touch the heart of malaysians coming from that part of the world you know sabah was a region by itself it's not a state and also the right for example like autonomy uh, on certain sector of the economy a certain sector of the power that we have in the country so return it back as what had been embedded under 63 and through that sort of process they realized that well you know this is the first time a leader coming from that part of the world we have been able to bring this to parliament for voting you know unfortunately we didn't realize that because uh amno rejected that move and some of the party like pass also rejected that sort of uh, uh, proposal and uh, when i checked when i talked to some of my colleagues coming from Sarawak, they were they did, they did indicate the two three uh, okay we will vote for you you know come the time and said we will go i think it's time for us to you know uh, have a chance to uh, administer the country so actually I, I i did realize there was two of them who missed me i said uh, and i hold one of the sd I gave it to myself. I don't want to mention them. It's okay. okay. It's your work. <laughs> after after having discussion, because some of my colleagues from uh, opposition, Kitsiang, Guan Eng, Mat Sabo, you know, give a chance to Anwar uh, to become the candidate. But uh, I knew about that, the difficulties of getting the number. Because uh, had I said, like, I am the one, you know, yeah. uh, as I could have just uh, garnered the support, for example, like 20, 30, MPs, but on the other block, of my component, Amana, PKR, DAP, is about 80 plus. So if you combine that, that could have been, we are better able to realize the number. But to so like, uh, win. So now I, I don't know what's happening because all the SDs will be the king. You know? Right. Uh, of course, so, that's, that's, really, that's it. I, I was able to sort of like entice them. Uh, because I, when I when I was uh, when I was a rural minister, I spent most of my time in Sarawak, helping them, you know, uh, with all sort of things, the constructions of road, building up the longhouses. I slept in the longhouses in Sarawak. Most of the MPs knows me, you know. So I thought that why not? You know, I'll, I'll be in a better position to lure that sort of support coming from that sort of society, group of people. So anyway, is a good case because I said why not? I don't want to. Just uh, sort of like I'm the candidate, but end of the day we are divided block. I don't want right. to provide that opportunity. I'm not driven by lust for for, for for that sort of position. Let's show to the world. I'm very sincere. I told Anwar Ibrahim. I laid out my card. I said this is it. This this is the uh, these are my SD to you uh, to, to support you. So I do hope that in future, uh, if I open myself, please support me. Yeah. Just one last question before we go to the Q&As from the audience. There's quite a number on uh, party hop and all that. You know, even if the secret ballots, the SDs are not in your favour, the three, there's still the vote in parliament, the confidence vote. And that will oh, be yeah. definitive okay. under the constitution. If it's just theoretically speaking, goes against PH+, would you then be putting yourself forward in parliament to say, look, this is time we all came together for you. What do you think? Well, I did discuss with my including Anwar Ibrahim too, <laughs> and including uh, Mad Sabu and Guaneng and Govin and uh, Tu Mahathir as well. So I think, uh, well, I did indicate to them, if you fail to do that, why not give a chance to me? I mean, I don't mind. It's not going to be an easy task because, uh, you know, you, you, you're talking about there's a prime minister in front of you. You're telling, I mean, under the SD, there's no clear, I mean, there's no clarity that who is, nobody is a prime minister yet. So here you are, providing your sort of like candidacy to fight against somebody who's a prime minister. But uh, you have to have a political will and you offer yourself. And I think uh, what is important is not about position here. Now I believe that that uh, we can do better, you know, to run the country. Not only to run the country, to build the nations, to unite Malaysia. You know, after having said, I was, I was a minister of unity and culture in Malaysia for two years, you know, I'm mistaken. You spend less money on that sort of outfit. It's very unfortunate after having independent for more than 60 years, you know, with that sort of multiracial society that we have, we look down upon that. The outfit 
uniting the people to have a better understanding to provide all sort of instrument like policies and law i want to ensure it's not just because recognitions of culture respect of languages i think we have to go deeper into touching the heart of malaysians in this country to have a better understanding to unite them i told them i said i spoke in parliament i did say that for example like we are building a nation here you know we're building a race i love my race as a malay i love my religion as a muslim but we know that in the constitution is clearly clearly embedded there the right of our religion as an official as an official religion in the country the right of malay and buin putra in this country is already there in the law i mean it's not the constitution if you were to unwind that you need two third majority how can you unwind that when you have a member of parliament in kelantan none of them coming from chinese indian Terengganu as well none of them is in india no chinese in sabah there's only about three or four members of parliament so why worry about that but the use of race and religion to garner the support and then without them realizing you're molding the perceptions and the mind of the people and this is not healthy that's why i said go beyond that don't use religion and race we need to unite malaysian and that's why i said the question when uh, i mean sorry <laughs> the, the question whether i should offer myself but i have already indicated to my colleague i say it's okay no i'm not i'm not hard up for you know the, i'm not driven by last or the greed to become but we believe that we can do better why not you know to uniting malaysians so i do hope that my colleague can accept that if that if that is so then i don't mind to offer myself to to be a candidate in this uh, you know uh, motions to be held in parliament i'm losing you i can yeah i don't go ahead yeah that is right we've had a few questions from the audience uh, from uh, Datin Shalini and Viswari um about anti hopping legislation you mentioned the word enticement uh, or entice uh, just now <laughs> getting people uh, to do this or that um you know and it, it was used as a bargaining chip recently right when uh, Tan Sri Muhyiddin said look uh, once in a lifetime reforms anti hopping laws uh get those things in uh, you know what are your thoughts on that uh, and can you commit to backing anti hopping legislation it's a pretty serious problem you know sabah 1985 we had that problem before uh, up, all the way until today uh seen documentaries on that uh, your thoughts uh, that tree indeed i do agree with you 100% if that can be realized i'll be the one of the guy who will definitely vote for it I'll vote for it because I think it's indeed very important for us to build the values among us. But actually, mm -hmm. law is not good enough. But how can you inculcate good values among us as human, as a politician? You know, when you mention about enticing people, I didn't mean I didn't intend no. to say yeah, that I, out of context. <laughs> Fair enough. That with with money, <laughs> no. I, I even during my campaign, after serving my area for this is my seventh term, I told him I said, yeah. "Vote me because of I I give you money." you know vote me because mm -hmm. i can entice you with other things i said vote me because if you believe that i can render a better service than others yeah you know well i i did i did realize when i had the last uh, elections 14 i spent less than almost 70000 i think you know yeah. but my majority went up but they were spending millions of money so i told the voters in my hometown so please vote me just because i can you know because i i, I give you money no you know it's not about money here it's about my service if you believe that judge me by my service mm -hmm. to to the place that's why i've been winning the elections for how many terms already so i think the trust is there that's very important for us i think so i will definitely uh, support that sort of thing as i think we had, we need to install that but beside law alone because yeah. people tend the tendency for them to breach law is always there i mean through the process of human life i've seen that but we need to inculcate we have yeah. to start at a young age for example like in school you know yeah. that sort of things you know if you are able to inculcate that sort of culture and values among us i'm quite sure i think it will deter them from jumping are you i mean for okay? example like even even now for example like even yesterday <laughs> even you know this afternoon metro sri can you come up with us all sort of things uh, yeah. viral in in, in in our country the uh, the shafi has been offered deputy prime minister cum minister finance also things but i can tell you they have they have they have called me actually <laughs> some of them yeah. 
even my uh, some of my colleague before when I mean, uh, they said come over you'll be legitimate it's not about position here yeah. it's about serving the country you know i mean you know, what sort of values do i have we want the election last for example yeah. we were mandated by the people in this country to rule the to, to rule the country but yet had sort of like if i joined with my brother mahudin you know leaving my old colleague from dap pakatan harapan mahadir just because i've been awkward is that sort of values that i'm uh, going into I don't, i don't think that is the that is the i mean it's important for us i think we need to have good values among us the need for us to inculcate we must start from the young you know i i know that's why i said the 18 years old uh, must be there yeah allow them to work for this country don't and don't sort of assume underestimate them or they are not capable to decide the future of this country please they are the future I mean, we're working now for the future of those guys. Yeah, that that is true. On on the point of integrity and you know keeping to your values and things like that. How what percentage of parliament share your values and think like you? Honestly. Well, uh, it's appalling to say that. It's just not. It's not. I mean, you have seen that. <laughs> Off trading is so rampant. There you go. Yeah. You know the use of high-handed kind of system. The use of all instrument, you know, I think it's appalling to see that among members of parliament now. That's why the need for us, I think, uh, in the coming years, we need to get as many as possible people with not only good values but corporate leaders as well to better yeah. govern this country. Not only comprising from uh, you know politicians who has been from the from the grassroots from the very beginning. I think we have to just like what happened in Canada. You know, in Canada. You know, the, the group of people who are really well knowledgeable, exposed to all sorts of things, challenges in business, and they are better able now to run the country. I mean, you look at Indonesia now. I think Jokowi is, have done that, and I think it is important for us to to move forward to ensure that there's no values. I'm so sorry. The answer is, I I, I don't want to make judgment, but it's appalling to see that. I, I I look I look at it. That's why, even those guys when they offer me a post. You know, say forget about it. You know, I mean, uh, here we are. You know, I'm here in politics. It's not just because for a year or two. You know, is the people will make judgment. I might win the battle, but I will lose the war. So I don't right. want it to happen. Because end of the day, I might be attracted, but just because my, well, you know, being a deputy prime minister, you have a private jet. All the bodyguards are there. Forget about it. You know, so basically, no durians for you then, yeah. No, 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 don't entice me. Don't entice me. I, I mean, they know me well. They know me well. I mean, uh, my colleague, uh, my you know, also. Doctor Sri, if I may, um, just stay on the topic of leadership and young leaders. So you spoke about Unila Pamblas. You mentioned YB Said Sadik. Um, you know, your party has quite a number of young leaders. Um, you know, and then there are many of them who have also become ministers and deputy ministers. Um, so, and and someone like you, a veteran politician who. When people speak of you, we mentioned earlier, you talk about PM, DPM. But what about the next generation? So, what are your plans to continue to harness, you know, these young leaders and build their appeal for the future? Well, we need to reform our yeah. to better able to produce leaders, not only to become politicians, all sorts of things, various uh, sectors of services that we they can render to the country. I think that is the way forward. You talk about the young people to ensure that. I mean. They can be doctors, become prime minister. They can be accountant to become prime minister. But on top of that, what sort of values that we need to inculcate that in our education system in this country? So we have to look into a bigger picture on how to mold that sort of values to ensure that in the future the younger people. But we need to, when you want to attract the younger people to be on board, that we have to show a good example as well. You know, by doing that, I'm quite sure. Think the, the rest of the guy. Why? Sometimes people are quite, uh, you know, skeptical. Even they were confused. They say, "Why is Tadu Shafi so stubborn?" I mean, he's been offered. I mean, you know, some of my YBs who has been in politics quite for some time. You know, it's so tough to become an opposition. You know, you to render services. You, you know, it's so taxing, especially when you're representing the poor people. But I told him, I said, I know. Well, don't judge that just because you know. Do the service. There are the things that we can do, 
you know, we, but uh, if if we inculcate that sort of values, the uh, wrong values in life, then uh, by setting bad example among the young, and then it's quite difficult for us to attract them. I think that's important for us, not only to ensure that uh, the system among families as well, you know, inculcate that sort of value. But this is this is a big kind of issues. If I think we need about three hours to explain. <laughs> to elaborate on sort of things, how best we can attract the young people. But that's why my party has been one of the big, I, I think the only party with the bigger numbers of young. You have Daryl Dej, you have Aziz Jaman, you have this... Yeah, uh, 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 number. Joanna is a lawyer, master in law. I, I put her as a candidate, she lost the elections. There are quite a good number of them. I think I'm here at the age of 60 plus, uh, still young, I'm 64, with uh, seven grandchildren. And I think uh, I do my part as well to ensure that how best that I can be together with the young, to ensure that I can provide that sort of, uh, uh, sort of like environment uh, to bring them up. I've been trying to guide them. Even, for example, like KJ, you know, during this sort of thing, uh, COVID, coronavirus, I didn't have enough time to uh, deliver my speech. Only I was given five minutes then. How can you <laughs> I do remember that? that? That sort of idea sort of thing. So I decided I called them up. I called some of the ministers. I said, uh, can you provide the system way to enable those people to have vaccine? But I told, I told him, I said, the first thing that you need to do is vaccine. Because that's what have been, uh, you know, it's about science. To to enable yourself being protected, immune system is getting stronger. You have to believe in that. But how can you ensure that those poor people coming from a remote area, uh, to ensure that when they come to the town, when they go to the town area, to the town hall, to getting the vaccinations, that they will be there. You know, that's why the problem, for example, like in Teningo recently, it was reported, thousands of people queue. They went there at four o'clock in the morning. And four o'clock in the afternoon, they have, they were so upset they they couldn't get the vaccine because why? Not in the vaccine, so they have to go back. And there's no public transport in that particular area. So I told him, I said, decentralize that system, allow walking, don't make it so tedious where the people need to fill up form. Those poor people, I had some of them, the kampung folks that doesn't have proper educations, just take the IC, fill it up. I said, enable them. We are saving human life here. We, are, we shouldn't be so meticulous asking those people, do you have any illnesses? Do you have, of course, that is important. Make it so tedious to them, getting them vaccinated. I think it is important, enlighten it, decentralize the power, you know, that sort of thing. For example, like when I cited, you know, a spike in Shah Alam, a spike in Kelang, you close down the factories in, in Perlis, you close down the factories in Sabah. I mean, don't have that sort of policy across the board. You know, it doesn't fit at all. I mean, the size doesn't, I mean, these are sort of things. We must be mindful. I mean, we have been the government for long. It doesn't mean that we don't have the knowledge. We don't have the know-how. We have to go deeper. We have to discuss with the industry player, for example, like when you have across the board a policy of 30%, people can go to the factories and operate them. If it is a labor intensive with a thousand workers, then it is quite okay because 300 people will turn up. If it's an automation kind of factories, mechanization, the need of, say, like only about 10 people, and when it's 30%, and it's only or two guys will be operating, my God, it was so tedious. You cannot apply that sort of policy across the board. You have to look into that, uh, you know, very meticulously to ensure that it's a very effective policy, it's a very effective kind of tools to ensure that we can get the country back. Uh, to, to to what we have experienced before. I think this is indeed very important for us. So, I mean, Dr. Sri, to be fair, that's hindsight, right? We're looking at the crisis from the perspective of, you know, in the rear view mirror. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Lisa Harun. What would you do differently in managing COVID uh, if you were to go back into power going forwards? Uh, what sort of ideas do you have, new things that we can do and try? Well, I think as being proposed by Tun Mahathir, we must have a special body, you know, managing COVID. We need those people who are uh, sorry, knowledgeable, you know, they're scientists, they're specialists uh, in this country, that sort of committee, empower them yeah. and ensure that they're dedicated and 
not only in terms of giving sort of like enough you know, funding manpower it was a provide that sort of executive power to them as well but sort of like we have to look into deeper into that and then just like what happened before when we faced the financial crisis we have this platform like m10 that sort of group of people comprising from all sort of work life businesses uh well exposed kind of uh, technocrat and they provide that sort of uh, prescriptions to the cabinet and we still and go thoroughly and it must be implemented and that sort of output is indeed very important for us to ensure that we are better able because it should not be a special kind of putih majlis jawatan kuasa comprising of all politicians my goodness you know and then uh, they will be sort of like uh, you know they will be attracted for example if you don't uh, put uh, politicians representing one particular party i need my party to be involved i need that sort of things out there you know, and then focus into the political interest put that aside you know we are saving human life here. and similarly concurrently i think we need also to look into for example like managing the economy i mean we have to admit that the cabinet cannot functions to the grassroots on the ground there. we have to have an outfit uh, getting people you are, who are involved in the businesses in all the sectors and also international people too as well getting on board to ensure that how can we connect that's a policy to ensure that to attract not only investors to export our product this is an example like when i when i spoke to my colleague tony fernandez he came to see me when i was then the chief minister so i said you know i i foresee something will be happening i said you know tony i said uh, you know because he was in needing of money so i said but asia is one of the only outfit in the country i mean mass is one but i was quite uh, attracted by because i know that uh, you know we cannot be dependent on mass alone to having the airline to transport people you know i told him i said convert your airline not only to bring passengers but also bringing all sort of food items you know for example like i i introduced this blue kind of print where i encourage the kampung folks i give them land five acres 10 acres you know and enrich them we're sort of providing all sort of things fertilizer the special kind of breed of uh, vegetable chili which can uh, can generate income for them so i told him i said after that i told tony fernandez transport them because if you transport seafood coming from sabah coming from other part of the area like sarawak even beji you know all sort of things you don't have to quarantine that and sabah is so near to market like china hong kong japan and uh, i told i told him i said no i lend you the money but of course you have to have a security and then i said you know five aircraft there if you fail to pay that aircraft will be given back to me and i because we have this outfit sabah a i said <laughs> and i can use that aircraft to ensure that we are able to transport over. so that sort of things that i think we have to look into but the detail part of it but uh, the question that you posed to me just now with regard to covid we have to have a special body and then we need to decentralize that you know, to ensure that uh, we are better able. I did suggest, for example, like uh, K- to KJ, I said, why don't you deploy, for example, like all those young, you know, students, the final year students, medic. You have that in UMS, well, you have that in, in, in most of the universities in our country. After all, they become uh, doctors at the end of the day. They will practice that. Deploy them. Because we are needing manpower here. I mean, we're having crisis of coronavirus, COVID here. So, but uh, if we have that sort of manpower around us, I mean, you can imagine, for example, like in my hometown, not enough ambulance, not enough specialists there. So these are the handicap that we have. I think uh, we have been underfunding that particular up in health ministry. That was one of the reasons why I set up Ministry of Health in Sabah. When That's I was right, there, yeah. I want to ensure that we are better able to provide that sort of services to 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 the people in the country. I think uh, the question is, we need to have a special outfit. But the most, the most important part is that we need to have ample supply of vaccine. And uh, I did suggest, for example, like, you know, don't have this uh, Pfizer loan, you know, Sinovac, because you need double dose. I suggested, even in Parliament, too, I said one dose is good enough because it's serious. All the public, I mean, particularly the rural folks, to getting vaccinated. You know, that was a very good idea. Them. Uh, so I told you, uh, told to dream of an area, an island, an island, rivers. If you have one single dose, it's a done deal for them. You don't, mm-hmm. that's, it's not cumbersome for them to come over. 
Okay, then, well, Dr. Dr. Free, we, uh, is it okay if we took a little bit more of your time? I know we promised an hour, but this has been such an interesting by, conversation. By all means, by all means. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm your uh, I told my family, I said, uh, I'm with the Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> Oh, um, thank you. Very I've got a question on what uh, you just said just now um, about you know forming a special team. If in the next few days or weeks or whatever, there is no solution coming from Parliament, right? Would something like what Tun Mahathir suggested, a Magarana NOC comprising of what you just mentioned just now, a uh, group of professionals, would that be the you know sort of like best way forwards? If someone has you know, 105, the other one has you know, 105, it, it doesn't really solve the impasse. Um, you know, if, if no, one, no one really has the numbers, you get what I mean. Is that something that you know, we could use for the next year or two before GE15? I, I, I'm quite sure, I think, but not Megarin. I have yeah. discussed this with Kul Mahadir. I think mm. the use of agencies in Megarin as a tool has never been applied in many other countries too. And we have used that in Malaysia. Now, after yeah. using that, what is the outcome? Increasing number of people dying, and now number of people positive. Is it unemployment? Is there? I mean, that will deter investors coming in. What is important for us when we have that sort of outfit, the Majlis, for example, like special kind of body there. But we need to empower them. You know, mm -hmm. we cannot have sort of like you know another minister is looking into the lockdown. You know, MCO and another minister looking into vaccines. Another minister looking into all sort of hospital whether there's enough bed or not. You know, I mean, uh, there must be a special body. I do agree with you. I think uh, that is indeed very important. If that uh, doesn't materialize. I need the need for us to have that outfit. I will I'll support that sort of like ideas. Yeah. There was a question from an audience uh, member, Emma, or maybe our Emma. Um, would you, you know, can, um, you know, YB Kairi Jamaluddin has been doing a good job with the vaccinations. And I think a lot of people are quite anxious now that he's no longer sort of um, the minister because uh, of what's currently happening. Um, a lot of us are in fear. Any... <laughs> Sorry, Faisal? A lot of us are in fear. <laughs> yes. And, and so, so coming back to the young leadership, uh, future leadership sort of situation, do you see him as somebody that would con should continue on in that role? Uh, and would a unity government be something that's possible, you know, uh, well, to have unity and the best team? So that's the question that's just flashed across the screen. Why not? Why not? Well, I've been, I've been, uh, you can ask KJ, even when I was then together in Amno, I've been trying my level best to groom some of the young. You know, KJ is one of them, Side City is one of them, their liking is one of them, why not? I mean, it's not for the good of my political career. It's for the good of the country. If you uh, notice and you realize that a young person can contribute better to the country, give them a chance, groom them. Because don't forget, if they can do a better service, it's not only good for you. Your generations, your grandchildren will, will deserve that. Will, if they render a good service, they will have it. Young, I think, why not? Speaking of this, uh, Dr. Sri, I think the next question would be, um, you once said that Warisan looks to become a national party, and I'm just wondering, would you be contesting in the upcoming general election at the national level? Uh, because clearly your passion and sort of the values you have are universal values. They're not, uh, of course, they come from um, where your environment and what you've seen throughout your political career. So, yep, do you see Warisan contesting uh, as a national party in the next general election? Well, I've been discussing this with Said Siddiq as well. Some of the young, they came to see me, a few of them, uh, doctors, you know, lawyers uh, in KL, and I discussed with them. I tried to attract them. I said, why not? You know, that's why uh, now Warisan is expanding in the wings to Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So I think to enable them to provide that sort of platform, because for them to join to other parties, I think it's quite difficult because uh, it's very dynamic and uh, some some of the outfit that we have I mean I've been in Amno for many years for young guys to get out is extremely difficult I mean uh, you know that's why it is indeed we have to have that sort of it that's why what is and I said when I I've, I've been grooming in Sabah and I'm quite successful well, I was then better able to getting their liking even to expose him at a young age to become the Minister of International Trade you know, and uh, some of them, I said, uh, Munira, you know, Aziz, I said, why not? I think 
the the reason why uh, I decided to and my colleague too to expand our you know, wings to peninsula because I don't want to confine myself to just having 25 members of parliament. And this is what problem that we're facing now. It's about numbers, you see. <laughs> and uh, so here you are. And then uh, how, how can you ensure that, you know, you'll be just, is it, well, I, I need to become deputy prime minister. I need to become finance, uh, finance minister. If you don't give me the post, forget about it. So you can't form the government. You'll be held in ransom. Can I, can I just push that? back on that? If, that the values, <laughs> if the values are not there, if the values are there, I don't mind. So that's why I've been I've been looking into it. I mean, you look at what happened in United Kingdom. You look at what happened in the uh, US. In you in for hundred years, more than hundred, three or four hundred years in United Kingdom, there's only two. One that's is conservative right. and liberal. And in, in, in US, there's only two parties, Democrat and Republican. So the people are not divided. The people, you know, can easily divide. They can easily, you know, realize that, wow, the choice is here. So within that small group of people, but of course, you cannot uh, refrain them under the constitutions because we provide that sort of platform. Every people have every right to form an association. So, I mean, it's under the constitution. Article 10, if I'm mistaken, we think we, we, we shouldn't refrain them from doing that. But of course, we should not have so many parties. You know, uh, in this country, I mean, uh, that is somehow is it as an instrument that can divide people too. You know, that's why I decided to form a multiracial party. It's not based on race, it's not based on religion. But what is important, you know, looking into the issues of economy, looking into the issues of better health services, education, that is that is equally important too. You know. I mean, uh, let me just push back on that a bit, Dr. Sri, because if Warisan spreads its wings into Semenanjung. Wouldn't that add yet another party onto the ballot and divide the vote even more, uh, which is the problem that we face right now, right? No single party uh, has a very, very large, uh, overwhelming majority. Uh, you, know, you, you see the PAP in Singapore, for example. Uh, they go into a coronavirus crisis with a very strong mandate, a very strong leadership. Uh, there's no politicking and things like that. You know, it, it, do, do you see that as a problem? Yeah, actually, I do, I do realize that, but I think that's why we I I, I thought of that as well. Yeah. But uh, we decided we discussed with my colleague. Not all state that we contest, the selected area. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like uh, in the in the coming elections, I did uh, indicate to Sadiq because his uh, muda has been rejected, so he'll be in a bit difficult positions to contest in the future, and some of his colleagues lawyers and doctors, professionals, you know, entrepreneur. I think we need to have this sort of group of people to run the country as well. So I thought that why not, you know, so, but certain areas, I do agree with you. I, I, I It's not my intentions to divide. I mean, I'm quite sure I'm not going to place, for example, like Parisan in Nangkawi, in say like uh, Jorlun. I need my alliance too. You know, I have, to with, yeah, I have to work with my colleague. I'm not here to compete with them. But of yeah. course, I need to be present as well. If AMNO yeah. can be in Sabah, if PKR can be in sure. Sabah, if DAP yeah. can be in Sabah, why not Warisan, a party led by Sabahan to be in Semenanjung? Yeah. I mean, we have to look into that. That's why I said that sort of things that they might not be able to accept me, certain group of people to become the prime minister, but say, President Warisan. And the moment they realize, they get closer to me. And I also need to groom these young politicians in the country. I, I, that is in my heart. I, have, I, I feel that, that I'm obliged. You know, the role to groom young people in this country is indeed very important for me, you know, to contribute to realizing that good of number of people. Why not? I, re, I remember some of my young, I was a Supreme Council member when Hisham Mudim was still the youth leader. Bang, bang, can you come and launch my divisions? In, in in Johor, they, uh, I was just back from UN. I spent about a month there representing the country as a you know member of parliament in the uh, US. So after that, I was so exhausted. And I said, "Why not? Okay, I'll just stop over." And I felt ill after that. I was so exhausted, but it, nevertheless, I I took the pain. I mean, I took the trouble to say, "Okay, why not?" I just facilitate that sort of things to ensure that these young people must be there. Yeah. So, if I may just change very quickly. Um, 
the topic, I want to talk a little bit about the economy and the future, right? Um, the theme of the future of Malaysia. In, in previous interviews, you've mentioned, um, you know, like for instance, the growth of Kalimantan as the center, uh, the capital of Indonesia for the future, and how that creates opportunities for young people, economies, SMEs in Sabah and Sarawak. Um, could you maybe share with us some of your thoughts on the need for this uh, sort of economic stability and support for private businesses? And how would you approach this um, you know, uh, from your perspective? Well, we have been governing the countries and operating in silo, if I may say that. You know, I mean, for example, like uh, Sabah and Sarawak is a blessed you know, place where it is abundant natural resources there. 37% of our oil comes from Sabah. And guess, Sarawak is the biggest in the country producer. So when you look into it, how best we can monetize that sort of wealth that we have in our country to ensure that placing Malaysia as a competitive nation, not only in the region, in Southeast Asia, but also in the world. You can imagine, I mean, uh, you know, if you build up, for example, like a bigger port in Kudat, in Kota Kinabalu, you know, and then you can better service all the ships, cargo, crossing South China Sea, from Hong Kong, from Japan, from China, you know, and then you can imagine that the wealth that we have, I mean, refinery that you can set up. I mean, for example, I suggested to have a better financial system in Labuan because it's already considered as one of it, but I think we need to enhance that because uh, Kalimantan will be, will be a capital city of Indonesia. So we'll be 100 millions of people moving from Jakarta, doing businesses in that part of the area. So if we're better able to provide that sort of financial inst uh, institutions there, so we'll be able to attract investment, saving, and that's sort of one money by billions. You can imagine the bank can use that to lend it to some of the sectors that we have to better develop our country. I think you look at the big, bigger picture of this, uh, this country, we have to monetize the wealth that we have. Malaysia is so blessed, you know, I mean, in terms of, uh, I remember when I met the president of Tanzania, when I was then the chairman of Commonwealth. So when I visited the Tanzania, because my second general was uh, Dr. Sija. He come from that part of the world. He was a former minister of education uh, coming from Tanzania. So when I spoke to the president, he said, well, you know, Mr. Chairman, because I was chairman, so he called me chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we want to learn how, how Malaysia has progressed quite well, you know. Uh, compared to many other, you know, developing countries, third world countries, you know, we need to learn from Malaysia. So I told him, I said, one of the areas that I touched was the civil servant that we have, you know, the human capital that we have. We are better able. I mean, our civil service, uh, civil servant is very productive. They're very capable. So I told, I told, I told them this is indeed very important for countries like African, I mean, in, in, in uh, third world countries, to produce that sort of human capital to run the country. I mean, just like what happened now, without the prime minister, the country still can function, you know. It doesn't mean that, wow, the, we won't be able to produce proton. No, we, we, the, no, no hospital can operate. It's still operating. I mean, don't, don't have that sort of feeling and fears that things will be collapsed, you know, things will be, you know, stranded everywhere. I mean, no, it's not that. The things still can function. So I think uh, on how we, 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 we can manage the economy, I think the need for us to have a proper kind of uh, management, not only in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, we are not so bad a country. I mean, our reserve is quite, is there, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, 100 billion US dollars is about 300. I mean, our borrowing is still quite okay, but the spending need to be, uh, the sort of like leakages in terms of spending that we have in our country, for example, like we spend billions of money on certain sectors, and yet what is it for, you know? I mean, for example, like having all this uh, high-speed railway from one end, I mean, you can reach Kota Baru, we have a better road. Is that a priority that we have for our country? I mean, uh, can it generate income, you know, that sort of things for the country? I mean, we have to look into the very sector, not only in terms of generating income, but also to ensure that, you know, provided jobs for the people and we're better able uh, to, to, to realize, uh, you know, competitiveness in Malaysia. That's why Sabah and Sarawak use that, 
as a leverage for making Malaysia a very competitive nation. That is my intention. That's why I open myself to become <laughs> the candidate of <laughs> You know, Dato Sri, just that. in, apparently 114 MPs for Ismail Sabri. Perhaps some closing thoughts from you. Where does Malaysia go from here? Well, as I, I, I did mention to you, this is just like, you know, merely a changing of curtain in the room. <laughs> And changing of, uh, you know, chairs in the room. Uh, I, I don't, the task is not there. And I have to tell you the truth, because I have been, I have been on the ground for many years. When I spoke to the, the people on the ground, you know, don't, we don't have trust in this government. That's why, had it not because of COVID, election could be the better solutions for us to get the mandate back, to ensure that we have a better and stable government. But unfortunately, we don't want to lose life of the people in this country. It's very important. So I did also mention during our earlier you know, uh, meeting with the king, When uh, we had the audience, I told him, I said, no, don't go for election, please. I mean, uh, this is not good for us. I mean, we have to better able to save people's lives. I said, uh, just uh, look into what are the venue that we can uh, have a best, better and stable government. So, well, you know, uh, as I mentioned just now, it's just a mere kind of uh, changing curtain in, in, in the room. If you ask Sad. me, short. <laughs> It is indeed very sad, but I know they will try to say, no, why don't you come over, as, uh, you know, that sort of thing. For me, I think it's important for me to do my service for other things as well. Well, we'll face it anyway. It has to be validated in Parliament. Mm -hmm. And um, just my last three... question. Is... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Good, no, no, go for it. Yeah. Uh, it says that it has to be tabled in Parliament soon. In your thoughts, how soon is soon? This month? Or next month? I don't know. No, it's not my. It's After not my call. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri, for all your thoughts. And you know, yeah. we covered quite an extensive ground. Uh, thank you for giving us the, the extra time as well. I will hand the floor back to Emma. Well, I do hope that I have enlightened all the questions that you posed to me. I do hope that I have answered some of the questions. You know. Yeah. If any, any kind of uh, post, but by all means, I can give my hand, hand phone and then uh, do. Oh, yes, it. please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be great. I mean, if you read the chat later on, I'm sure your team will, will help you to access the chat. There are, um, you obviously have a fan base out there, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people saying, you know, we need an East Malaysian to be the PM or the DPM. And I think that'll be a, as big a moment as when Malaysia wins its first Olympic gold medal. <laughs> the reaction will be the same. So thank you for, you know, being um, frank with us and sharing your thoughts. And, you know, we understand that it's quite a, a delicate time as well. So we really appreciate you coming and sharing your thoughts and telling us about what's happening. Um, it's been a very stressful few weeks for us as citizens, so I'm, I'm sure for, for you as well. Um, and we're very honored that you came and spent so much time with us um, this evening. Um, and yes, we would love to have you back when the dust settles a little bit um, and you can help us navigate with some clarity about what's going on and, and and certainly in terms of some of the wider issues in terms of politics, the economy, education, the relations with each Malaysia, East Malaysia, you know, we'd love to get your more detailed thoughts on those um, as well. So thank you um, for joining us. That was great. I'd like to say thank you to um, Faisal and Daniel for all your questions and um, thank you to the Oxbridge team for helping with Um, the questions. It's always a team effort when we when we pull these things together. Thank you to um, Sean, Liana for all the tech support, to Mark and Sharifa for helping to moderate the many, many questions across um, the platform. So, um, and thank you. And are we as well? Thanks to are we <laughs> for yes. setting things up? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, thank you it's to very Yeah, yeah. and Zamri as well. well. Yeah. And I'm so yeah. delighted. I'm so happy to be with you all. Yeah. Please do communicate with me. I like to engage. I mean, this is indeed very important for us, to for the okay. future of the country, for the people. Yeah. Why not? Please don't hesitate. Okay. Will do. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shifa. Thank you. Take that. care. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for joining us, and um, good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shifa. Good night.